Chapter 13, The Rise of Mass Democracy, 1824 to 1840. The so-called era was never entirely tranquil, but even the illusion of national consensus was shattered by the Panic of 1819 and the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Economic distress and the slavery issue raised the political stakes in the 1820s and 1830s. Vigorous political conflict, once feared, came to be celebrated as necessary for the health of a democracy. The new, new political parties emerged, new styles and campaigning took hold, a new chapter opened in the history of American politics. The political landscape of 1824 was similar in its broad outlines to that of 1796. By 1840, it would be almost unrecognizable. The deference, apathy, and virtually non-existent party organizations of the era of good feelings yielded to the boisterous democracy, frenzied vi uh, vitality, and strong political parties of the Jacksonian era. The old suspicion of political parties as illegitimate disruptors of society's natural harmony gave way to an acceptance of the sometimes wild contentiousness of political life. In 1828, an energetic new party, the Democrats, captured the White House. By the 1830s, the Democrats faced an equally vigorous opposition party in the form of the Whigs. This two-party system institutionalized different divisions that had vexed the revolutionary generation and came to constitute an important part of the nation's checks and balances on political power. New forms of politicking emerged in this era as candidates used banners, badges, parades, barbecues, free drinks, and baby kissing to, quote, get out the vote. Voter turnout rose dramatically. Only about one quarter of eligible voters cast a ballot in the presidential election of 1824, but that proportion doubled in 1828, and in the election of 1840, it reached 78 percent. Everywhere, the people flexed their political muscles. So overview of this chapter in here, I'm kind of pausing from the reading for a minute. You have a vibrant democracy, contentious political parties, a lot more bickering, um, and you also have the emergence of a new parties. So the party system changes again, and we now have the Democrats and the Whigs, two different new parties kind of merging out of the old ones. Back to the reading. The Corrupt Bargain of 1824. The last of the old style elections was marked by the controversial Corrupt Bargain of 1824. The woods were full of presidential timber as James Monroe, last of the Virginia dynasty, completed his second term. Four candidates towered above the others. John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, highly intelligent, experienced, and aloof. Henry Clay of Kentucky, the gamey and gallant, Harry of the West. William H. Crawford of Georgia, an able though ailing giant of a man. And Andrew Jackson of Tennessee, the gaunt and gusty hero of New Orleans. All four rivals professed to be Republicans. Well-organized parties had not yet emerged. Their identities were so fuzzy, in fact, that John C. Calhoun appeared as the vice presidential candidate on both Adams and the Jackson tickets. The results of this noisy campaign were interestingly but con interesting but confusing. Jackson, the war hero, clearly had the strongest of personal appeal, especially in the West, where his campaign against the forces of corruption and privilege in government resonated deeply. He polled almost as many popular votes as his next two rivals combined, but he failed to win a majority of the electoral vote. In such a deadlock, the House of Representatives, as directed by the 12th Amendment, must choose among the top three candidates. Clay was thus eliminated, yet as Speaker of the House, he presided over the very chamber he had to pick the winner, that had to pick the winner. The influential Clay was in a position to throw the election to the candidate of his choice. He reached his decision by the process of elimination. Crawford, recently fell by a paralytic stroke, was out of the picture. Clay hated the military chieftain Jackson, his arch-rival for the allegiance of the West. Jackson, in turn, bitterly resented Clay's public denunciation of his Florida foray in 1818. The only candidate left was the puritanical Adams, with whom Clay, a free-living gambler and duelist, had never established cordial personal relations. But the two men had much in common politically. Both were fervid nationalists and advocate of the American system. Shortly before the final balloting in the House, Clay met privately with Adams and assured him of his support. Decision Day came early in 1825. The House of Representatives met amid tense excitement, with sick members being carried in on stretchers. On the first ballot, thanks largely to Clay's behind-the-scenes influence, Adams was elected president. A few days later, the victor announced that Henry Clay would be the new Secretary of State. The office of Secretary of State was the prize plum then, even more so than today. Three of the four preceding secretaries had reached the presidency, and the high cabinet office was regarded as an almost certain pathway to the White House. By allegedly dangling the position as a bribe before Clay, Adams, second choice of the people, apparently defeated Jackson, the people's first choice. Masses of angry Jacksonians, most of them common folk, raised a roar of protest against this corrupt bargain. The clamor continued for nearly four years, 
Jackson condemned Clay as the Judas of the West, and John Randolph of Virginia publicly assailed the alliance between the Puritan Adams and the Blackleg Clay, who he added, shines and stinks like rotten mackerel by moonlight. Clay, outraged, challenged Randolph to a duel, though poor marksmanship and shaky nerves rendered the outcome bloodless. No positive evidence has yet been unearthed to prove that Adams and Clay entered into a formal bargain. Clay was a natural choice for such a purpose, and Adams was both scrupulously honest and not given to patronage. Even if a corrupt bargain had been struck, it was not necessarily corrupt. Even if a bargain had been uh, struck, it was not necessarily corrupt. Deals of this nature had long been in stock and trade of politics. But the outcry over Adams' election showed that change was in the wind. What had once been a common practice was now condemned as furtive, elitist, and subversive of democracy. The next president would not be chosen behind closed doors. A Yankee misfit in the White House. John Quincy Adams was a chip off the old family glacier. Short, thick-set, and billiard-balled, he was even more frigidly austere than his presidential father, John Adams. Shunning people, he often went for early morning swims, sometimes stark naked, in the then pure Potomac River. Essentially a closeted thinker rather than a politician, he was irritable, sarcastic, and tactless. Yet few individuals have ever come to the presidency with a more brilliant record in statescraft, especially in foreign affairs. He ranks as one of the most successful secretaries of state, yet one of the least successful presidents. A man of puritanical honor, Adams entered upon his four-year sentence in the White House, smarting under the charges of bargain, corruption, and usurpation. Fewer than one-third of the voters had voted for him. As the first minority president, he would have found it difficult to win popular support even under the most favorable conditions. He did not possess many of the usual arts of the politician, and scorned those who did. He had achieved high office by commanding respect, rather than courting popularity. In an earlier era, an aloof John Adams had won the votes of propertied men by sheer ability. But with the, advent, with the dawning age of backslapping and baby-kissing democracy, his codfish son could hardly hope for success in the polls. While Adams' enemies accused him of striking a corrupt bargain, his political allies wished that he would strike a few more. Whether through high-mindedness or political ineptitude, Adams resolutely declined to oust efficient office holders in order to create vacancies for his supporters. During his entire administration, he removed only 12 public servants from the federal payroll. Such stubbornness caused countless Adams to follow it, throw up their hands in despair. If the president would not reward party workers with political plums, why should they labor to keep him in office? Adams' nationalistic views gave him further woes. Much of the nation was turning away from the post ghent nationalism and toward states' rights and sectionalism, but Adams swam against the tide. Confirmed nationalist that he was, Adams urged upon Congress in his first mess annual message the construction of roads and canals. He renewed George Washington's proposal for a national university and went so far as to advocate federal support for an astronomical observatory. The public reaction to these proposals was prompt and unfavorable. To many workaday Americans, rubbing out stumps, astronomical observations, observatories seemed like a scandalous waste of public funds. The South in particular bristled. If the federal government should take on such heavy financial burdens, it would have to continue the hated tariff duties. Worse, if it could meddle in local concerns like education and roads, it might even try to lay its hand on the peculiar institution of black slavery. Adams's land policy likewise antagonized the Westerners. They clamored for wide open expansion and resented the president's well-meaning attempts to curb feverish speculation in the public domain. The fate of the Cherokee Indians, threatened by eviction from their holdings in Georgia, brought additional bitterness. White Georgians wanted the Cherokees out. The rugged, honest Adams attempted to deal fairly with the Indians. The Georgia governor, by threatening to resort to arms, successfully resisted the efforts of Washington government to interpose federal authority on behalf of the Cherokees. Another fateful chapter was thus written in the nullification of the national will and another nail was driven in Adams' political coffin. Going whole hog for Jackson in 1828. The presidential campaign for Andrew Jackson had started early, on February 9, 1825, the day of John Quincy Adams' controversial election by the House, and it continued noisily for nearly four years. Even before the election of 1828, the temporarily united Republicans of the era of good feelings had split into two camps. One was the National Republicans, with Adams as their standard bearer. The other was the Democratic Republicans with the fiery Jackson heading their ticket. Rallying cries of the Jackson zealots were, Bargain and corruption! Huzzah for Jackson! And all hail old Hickory! Jacksonites planted hickory poles for their hickory tough hero. Adamsites adopted the oak as a symbol of their oaken lead independent candidate. Jackson's followers presented their hero as a rough-hewn frontiersman and a stalwart champion of the common man. 
They denounced Adams as a corrupt aristocrat and argued that the will of the people had been thwarted in 1825 by the backstairs bargain of Adams and Clay. The only way to right the wrong was to seat Jackson, who would then bring about reform by sweeping out the dishonest Adams gang. Pause for a second. This is a little bit of the same mentality that the Trump followers have today in the 20 teens. And the idea of sweeping out the dishonest gang is kind of like his pl pl um, promise to drain the swamp of Washington. Going back. Much of this talk was political hyperbole. Jackson was no frontier farmer, but a wealthy planter. Over there. He was born in a log cabin, but now lived in a luxurious manner off the labor of his many slaves. And Adams, though perhaps an aristocrat, was far from corrupt. If anything, his puritanical morals were too elevated for Trump. Mudslinging reached new lows in 1828, and the electoral electorate developed a taste for bare-knuckle politics. Adams would not stoop to gutter tax, but many of his backers were less squeamish. They described Jackson's mother as a prostitute and his wife as an adulteress. They printed black-bordered handbills shaped like coffins, recounting his numerous duels and brawls and trumpeting his hanging of six mutinous militiamen. Jackson's men also hit below the belt. President Adams had purchased, with his own money, and for his own use, a billiard table and a set of chessmen. In the mouths of rabid Jacksonite, these items became gaming tables and gambling furniture for the presidential palace. Criticism was also directed at the large sums Adams had received over the years in federal salaries well-earned, though they had been. He was even accused of having procured a servant girl for the lust of the Russian Tsar, in short, of having served as a pimp. On voting day, the electorate split on largely sectional lines. Jackson's strong support came from the West and South. The Middle States and the Old Northwest were divided, while Adams won the backing of his own New England and the property better elements of the Northeast. But when the popular vote was converted to electoral votes, General Jackson's triumph could not be denied. Old Hickory had trounced Adams, by an electoral count of 178 to 83. Although a considerable part of Jackson's support was lined up by the machine politicians in eastern cities, particularly in New York and Pennsylvania, the political center of gravity clearly had shifted away from the conservative eastern seaboard for the emerging states across the mountain. Old Hickory as president. The new president cut a striking figure, tall, lean, with bushy iron gray hair brushed high above his prominent forehead, craggy eyebrows, and blue eyes. His irritability and emaciated condition resulted in part from a long-term bout with dysentery, malaria, tuberculosis, and lead poisoning from two bullets that he carried in his body from near-fatal duels. His autobiography was written in his lined face. Jackson's upbringing had its shortcomings. Born in the Carolinas and early orphaned, mischievous Andy grew up without parental restraints. As a youth, he displayed much more interest in brawling and cockfighting than his scanty opportunities for reading and spelling. Although he eventually learned to express himself in writing with vigor and clarity, his grammar was always rough-hewn and his spelling original, like that of his many contemporaries. He sometimes misspelled a word two different ways in the same letter. The youthful Carolinian shrewdly moved up west to Tennessee, where fighting was prized above writing. There, through native intelligence, force of personality, and powers of leadership, he became a judge and a member of Congress. Afflicted with a violent temper, he early became involved in a number of duels, stabbings, and bloody frays. His passions were so profound that on occasion he would choke into silence when he tried to speak. The first president from the West, the first nominated from a party, formal party convention in 1832, and, the on, and only the second without a college education, Washington was the first, Jackson was unique. His university was adversity. He had risen from the masses, but he was not one of them, except insofar as he shared many of their prejudices. Essentially a frontier aristocrat, he owned many slaves, cultivated broad acres, and lived in one of the finest mansions in America, the Hermitage, near Nashville. More westerner than easterner, more country gentleman than common clay, more courtly than crude, he was hard to fit into a new category. Jackson's inauguration seemed to symbolize the ascendancy of the masses. Hickoryites poured into Washington from far away, sleeping on hotel floors and in hallways. They were curious to see their hero take office and perhaps hope to pick up a well-paying office for themselves. Nobody's mingled with notables as the White House, for the first time, was thrown open to the multitude. A milling crowd of clerks, shopkeepers, hobnail artisans, and grimy laborers surged in, wrecking the china and furniture and threatening the people's champion with cracked ribs. Jackson was hastily spirited through a side door, and the White House miraculously emptied itself when word was passed that huge bowls of well-spiked punch had been placed on the lawns. Such was the inaugural ball brawl. To conservatives, this orgy seemed like the end of the world. King Mob reigned triumphant as Jacksonian vulgarity replaced Jeffersonian simplicity. Faint-hearted traditionalists shuddered, drew their blinds, and recalled with trepidation the opening scenes of the French Revolution. The Spoils of 
Once in power, the Democrats, famously suspicious of the federal government, demonstrated that they were not above striking some bargains of their own. Under Jackson, the spoil system, that is, rewarding political supporters with public office, I'm going to pause for a minute, spoil system, that is, rewarding political supporters with public office, was introduced into the federal government on a large scale. The basic idea was as old as politics. Its name came from Senator William Marcy's classic remark in 1832, to the victor belong the spoils of the enemy. The system had already secured a firm hold in New York and Pennsylvania, where well-greased machines ladled out the gravy of office. Pause for a second. This means if you supported me during the campaign, I'll find a job for you in government. It gives you a good pay, pay, uh, you know, new pay and a job. And if you're, you be loyal to me, I'll make sure you get a job. Jackson defended the spoil system on democratic grounds. Every man is as good as his neighbor, he declared, perhaps equally better. As this was believed to be so, and as routine as office was thought to be simple enough for any upstanding American to learn quickly, why encourage the development of an aristocratic, bureaucratic, office-holding class? Better to bring in new blood, he argued. Each generation deserved its turn at the public trough. Washington was due, it is true, for a house cleaning. No party overturn had occurred since the defeat of the Federalists in 1800, and even that had not produced wholesale evictions. A few office holders, their commissions signed by President Washington, were lingering on into their 80s, drawing breath and salary, but doing little else. But the spoil system was less about finding new blood than about rewarding old cronies. Throw the rascals out and put our rascals in, the Democrats were essentially saying. The questions asked of each appointee were not what can he do for the country, but what has he done for the party, or is he loyal to Jackson? Scandal inevitably accompanied the new system. Men who had openly bought their posts by campaign contributions were appointed to high office. Illiterates, incompetent, and plain crooks were given positions of public trust. Scoundrels lusted for the spoils, rather than the toils of office. Samuel Swartlock, uh, despite ample warnings of his untrustworthiness, was awarded the lucrative post of Collector of the Customs of the Port of New York. Nearly nine years later, he swarthwarded out for England, leaving his accounts more than a million dollars short, a fir the first person to steal a million dollars from the Washington government. But despite its undeniable abuse, the spoil system was an important element of the emerging two-party order, cementing as it did loyalty to party over competing claims based on economic class or geographic region. The promise of patronage provided a compelling reason for Americans to pick a party and stick with it through thick and thin. The Tricky Tariff of Abominations The touchy tariff issue had been one of John Quincy Adams' biggest headaches. Now Andrew Jackson felt his predecessor's pain. Tariffs protected American industry against competition from European manufactured goods, but they also drove up prices for all Americans and invited retaliatory tariffs on American agricultural exports abroad. The Middle States had long been supporters of protectionist tariffs. In the 1820s, influential New Englanders like Daniel Webster's gave up their traditional defense of free trade to support higher tariffs, too. The wool and textile industries were booming, and forward-thinking Yankees came to believe that their future prosperity would flow from the factory rather than from the sea. In 1824, Congress had increased the general tariff significantly, but wool manufacturers bleeded for still higher barriers. They didn't like a sheep like that. Ardent Jacksonites now played a cynical political game. They promoted a high tariff bill, expecting it to be defeated, which would give a black eye to President Adams. To their surprise, the tariff passed in 1828, and Andrew Jackson inherited the political hot potato. Southerners, as heavy consumers of manufactured goods with little manufacturing industry of their own, were hostile to tariffs. They were particularly shocked by what they regarded as the outrageous rates of the tariff of 1828. Hotheads branded it the Black Tariff, or the Tariff of Abominations. Several southern states adopted formal protests. In South Carolina, flags were lowered to half mass. Let the New England beware how she imitates the old, cried one eloquent South Carolinian. Why did the South react so angrily against the tariff? Southerners believed, not illogically, that the Yankee tariff discriminated against them. The bustling Northeast was experiencing a boom in manufacturing. The developing West was prospering from rising poverty values and a multiplying population, and the energetic Southwest was expanding into virgin cotton land. But the Old South was falling on hard times, and the tariff provided a convenient and plausible scapegoat. Southerners sold their cotton and other farm produce on a world market completely unprotected by tariffs, but were forced to buy their manufactured goods in an American market heavily protected by tariffs, making something expensive. Protectionism protected Yankee and Middle State manufacturers. The farmers and planters of the Old South felt they were stuck with the bill.
but much deeper issues underlay the Southern outcry, in particular a growing anxiety about possible federal interference with the institution of slavery. The congressional debate on the Missouri Compromise had kindled those anxieties, and they were further fanned by an aborted slave rebellion in Charleston in 1822, led by a free black named Denmark Vesey. The South Carolinians, still closely tied to the British West Indies, also knew full well that their slave-owning West Indian cousins were feeling the mounting pressure of British abolitionism on the London government. Of the, on the London government, abolitionism in America might similarly use the power of the government in Washington to suppress slavery in the South. If so, now is the time, and the tariff was the issue, to take a strong stand on the principle against all federal encroachments on states' rights. South Carolinians took the lead in protesting against the Tariff of, abomination, of Abominations. Their legislature went so far as to publish in 1828, though without formal endorsement, a pamphlet known as the South Carolina Exposition. It had been secretly written by John C. Calhoun, one of the few top-flight political theorists ever produced in America. As vice president, he was forced to conceal his authorship. The exposition denounced the recent tariff as unjust and unconstitutional. Going a stride beyond the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions of 1798, it bluntly and explicitly proposed that the states should nullify the tariff. That is, they should declare it null and void within their borders. Nullies in South Carolina. The stage was set for a showdown. Through, through Jackson's first term, the nullifiers, nullies they were called, tried strenuously to muster the necessary two-thirds vote for nullification in South Carolina but they were blocked by a determined minority of Unionists, scorned as submission men. Back in Washington, Congress tipped the balance by passing the new tariff of 1832. Though it pared away the worst abominations of 1828, it was still frankly protective and fall far short of meeting Southern demands. Worse yet, worse yet to many Southerners, it had a disquieting air of permanent, permanence being there forever. South Carolina was now nerved for drastic action. Nullifiers and Unionists clashed head-on in the state election of 1832. Nullies, defiantly wearing palmetto ribbons on their hats to mark their loyalty to the Palmetto State, South Carolina, emerged with more than two-thirds majority. The state legislature then called for a special convention. Several weeks later, the delegates, meeting in Columbia, solemnly declared the existing tariff to be null and void within South Carolina. As a further act of defiance, the convention threatened to take South Carolina out of the Union if Washington attempted to collect the custom dues by force. I want to repeat that for a minute, guys. They're saying that they're not going to file the tariff. They'll allow stuff in without the tariff. And if you, Washington tried to collect the tariffs in their state, <clears throat> they would attempt to uh, break out of the Union. Such tactics might have intimidated John Quincy Adams, but Andrew Jackson was the wrong president to stare down. The cantankerous general was not a diehard supporter of the tariff, but he would not permit defiance or disunion. His military instincts rasped. Jackson privately threatened to invade the state and have the nullifiers hanged. In public, he was only slightly less pugnacious. He dispatched naval and military reinforcements to the Palmetto State while quietly preparing a sizable army. He also issued a ringing proclamation against nullification, to which the governor of South Carolina, former Senator Robert Y. Hayne, responded with a counter-proclamation. The lines were drawn. If civil war were to be avoided, one side would have to surrender or would have to be a compromise. Conciliatory Henry Clay of Kentucky, now in the Senate, stepped forward. An unforgiving foe of Jackson, he had no desire to see his old enemy win new laurels by crushing the Carolinians and returning with the scalp of Calhoun dangling. Although he himself a supporter of tariffs, the gallant Kentuckian therefore threw his influence behind a compromise bill that would gradually reduce the tariff of 1832 by about 10%. Over a period of eight years, by 1848, the rates would be back at the mildly protective level of 1816. The Compromise Tariff of 1833 finally squeezed through Congress. Debate was bitter, with most of the opposition naturally coming from the protectionist New England and Middle States. Calhoun and the South favored the Compromise, so it was evident that Jackson would not have to use fire firearms and rope. But at that time, and partly as a face-saving device, Congress passed the Force Bill, known among Carolinians as the Bloody Bill. It authorized the president to use the army and navy, if necessary, to collect federal tariff duties. South Carolinians welcomed this opportunity to extricate themselves from a dangerously tight corner without loss of faith. To the consternation of the Calhounites, no other southern states had sprung to their support, though Georgia and Virginia toyed with the idea. Moreover, an appreciable unionist minority within South Carolina was gathering guns, organizing militia, and nailing stars and stripes to flagpoles. Faced with civil war within an invasion from out 
and so faced with civil war within and invasion from without, the Columbia Convention met again and repealed the Ordinance of Nullification. As a final but futile gesture of fish shaking, it nullified the unnecessary force bill and adjourned. Neither Jackson nor the Nullies won a clear-cut victory in 1833. Clay was the true hero of the hour, held in Charleston and Boston alike for saving the country. Armed conflict had been avoided, but the fundamental issues had not been resolved. When next the Nullies and the Union clashed, compromise would prove more elusive. Meaning it's essentially the Civil War the next time this happens. Nullification being a bitter fight against the South and the, uh, sorry, tariffs being an issue, it, it feels like it's against the South, and they're fearful of federal power over them, and the, fed, the fear of federal power to end slavery, perhaps, in the future. The Trail of Tears. Jackson's Democrats were committed to Western expansion, but such expansion necessarily meant confrontation with the current inhabitants of the land. More than 125,000 Native Americans lived in the forests and prairies east of the Mississippi in the 1820s. Federal policy toward them varied. Beginning in the 1790s, the Washington government ostensibly recognized the tribes as separate nations and agreed to acquire land from them only through formal treaties. The Indians were shrewd and stubborn negotiators, but this availed them little when Americans routinely violated their own covenants, erasing and redrawing treaty line after treaty line on their maps as white settlements pushed west. Many white Americans felt respect and admiration for the Indians and believed that the Native Americans could be assimilated into white society. Much energy, therefore, was devoted to civilizing and Christianizing the Indians. The Society for Propagating the Gospel Among Indians was founded in 1787, and many denominations sent missionaries into Indian villages. In 1793, Congress appropriated $20,000 for the promotion of literacy and agricultural and vocational instructions among the Indians. Although many tribes violate, violently resisted white encroachment, others followed the path of accommodation. The Cherokees of Georgia made especially remarkable efforts to learn the ways of the whites. They gradually abandoned their semi-nomadic life and adopted a system of settled agriculture and the notion of private property. Missionaries opened schools among the Cherokees, and the Indian Sequoia devised the Cherokee alphabet. In 1808, the Cherokee National Council legislated a written legal code, and in 1827, it adopted a written constitution that provided for executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. Some Cherokees became prosperous cotton planters and even turned to slaveholding. Nearly 1,300 black slaves toiled for their Native American masters in the Cherokee Nation in the 1820s. For these efforts, the Cherokees, along with the Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Seminoles, were numbered by the whites among the five civilized tribes. All this embrace of civilization apparently was not good enough for whites. In 1828, the Georgia legislature declared the Cherokee Tribal Council illegal and asserted its own jurisdiction over Indian affairs and Indian lands. The Cherokees appealed this move to the Supreme Court, which thrice upheld the rights of the Indians. But President Jackson, who clearly wanted open lands, open Indian lands to white settlement, refused to recognize the court's decision. In a callous jibe at the Indians' as defender, Jackson reportedly snapped, John Marshall made his decision, now let him enforce it. Feeling some obligation to rescue this much injured race, <clears throat> Jackson promote, proposed a bodily removal of the remaining eastern tribes, chiefly Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Seminoles, beyond the Mississippi. Emigration was supposed to be voluntary because it would be cruel and unjust to compel the Aborigines to abandon their graves to their fathers. Jackson evidently consoled himself with the belief that the Indians could preserve their native cultures in the wide open West. Jackson's policy led to the forced uprooting of more than 100,000 Indians. In 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, providing for the transplanting of all Indian tribes then resident east of the Mississippi. Ironically, the heaviest blows fell on the five civilized tribes. In the ensuing decade, countless Indians died on forced marches to the newly established Indian Territory, where they were to be permanently free of white encroachments. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was established in 1836 to administer relations with Americans' original inhabitants. But as the land-hungry palefaces pushed west faster than anticipated, the government's guarantees went up in smoke. The permanent frontier lasted about 15 years. Suspicious of white intentions from the start, Sauk and Fox Braves from Illinois and Wisconsin, ably led by Black Hawk, resisted eviction. They were bodily, bloodily crushed in 1832 by regular troops, including Lieutenant Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, and by volunteers, including Captain Abraham Lincoln of Illinois. <clears throat> in Florida, 
The Seminole Indians, joined by runaway black slaves, retreated to the swampy Everglades. For seven years, they waged a bitter guerrilla war that took the lives of some 1,500 soldiers. The spirit of the Seminole was broken in 1837 when the American field commander treacherously seized their leader, Osceola, under a flag of truce. The war dragged on for five more years, but the Seminoles were doomed. Some fled deeper into the Everglades, where their descendants now lived, but about four-fifths of them were moved to present-day Oklahoma, where several thousands of, of the tribe survived. The Bank War President Jackson did not hate all banks and all businesses, but he distrusted monopolistic banking and over-big business, as did his followers. A man of virulent dislikes, he came to share the prejudices of his own West against the, quote, moneyed monster known as the Bank of the United States. What made the bank a monster in Jackson's eyes? The national government minted gold and silver coins in the mid-19th century, but did not issue paper money. Paper notes were printed by private banks. Their value fluctuated with the health of the bank and the amount of money printed, giving bankers, private bankers considerable power over the nation's economy. No bank in America had more power than the Bank of the United States. In many ways, the bank acted like a branch of government. It was the principal depository for the funds of the Washington government and controlled much of the nation's gold and silver. Its notes, unlike those of smaller banks, were stable in value. A source of credit and stability, the bank was an important and useful part of the nation's expanding economy. But the Bank of the United States was a private institution, accountable not to the people, but to its elite circle of moneyed investors. Its president, the brilliant but arrogant Nicholas Biddle, held an immense and to many unconstitutional amount of power over the nation's financial affairs. Enemies of the bank dubbed him Tsar Nicholas I and called the bank a hydra of corruption, a serpent that grew new heads whenever old ones were cut off. To some, of the, bank's ver to some the bank's very existence seemed to sin against the egalitarian credo of American democracy. The conviction formed the deepest source of Jackson's opposition. <clears throat> the bank also won no friends in the West for foreclosing on many Western farms and draining tribute into Eastern coffers. Profit, not public service, was its first priority. The bank war erupted in 1832 when Daniel Webster and Henry Clay presented Congress with a bill to renew the Bank of the United States' charter. The charter was not set to expire until 1836, but Clay pushed for renewal four years early to make it an election issue in 1832. As Jackson's leading rival for the presidency, Clay, with fateful blindness, looked upon the bank issue as a surefire winner. Clay's scheme was to ram a recharter bill through Congress and then send it on to the White House. If Jackson signed it, he would alienate his worship Western, worshipful Western followers. If he vetoed it, as seems certain, he would presumably lose the presidency in the forthcoming election by alienating the wealthy and influential groups in the East. Clay seems not to have fully realized that, quote, the best people were now only a minority and that they generally fear Jackson anyhow. <clears throat> the recharter bill slid through Congress on greased skids, as planned, but was killed by a scorching veto from Jackson. The old hero declared the monopolistic bank to be unconstitutional. And of course, the Supreme Court had earlier declared it constitutional in the case of McCullough versus Maryland, but Jackson acted as though he regarded the executive branch as superior to the judicial branch. The old general growled probably, the bank is trying to kill me. I will kill it. Jackson's veto message reverberated with constitutional consequences. It not only squashed the bank bill, but vastly amplified the power of the presidency. All previous vetoes had rested almost exclusively on questions of constitutionality. But though Jackson invoked the Constitution in his bank veto message, he essentially argued that he was vetoing the bill because he personally found it harmful to the nation. In effect, he was claiming for the president alone a power to equivalent to two-thirds of the votes in Congress. If the legislative and executive branches were partners in government, he implied the president was unmistakably the senior partner. The gods continued to misguide Henry Clay. Delighted with the financial fallacies of Jackson's message, but blind to its political appeal, he arranged to have thousands of copies printed as a campaign document. The president's sweeping accusations may indeed have seemed demagogic to the moneyed interests of the East, but they made perfect sense to the common people. The bank issue was now thrown into the noisy arena of the Presidential Congress Contest of 1832. <clears throat> Old Hickory wallops Clay in 1832. Jackson and Clay were the chief gladiators in the looming electoral combat. The grizzled old general, who had earlier favored one term for a president and rotation in office, was easily persuaded by his cronies not to rotate himself out of office. Presidential power is a heady brew and can be habit-forming. The ensuing campaign was ruckus. The old hero's adherents again raised the hickory pole and bellowed, Jackson forever, go the whole hog. Admirers of Clay shouted, freedom and Clay. 
while the detractors harped on this on this dueling, gambling, cockfighting, and fast living. Novel features made the campaign of 1832 especially memorable. For the first time, a third party entered the field, a newborn anti-Masonic party, which opposed the influence of and fierce in, influence and fearsome secrecy of the Masonic order. Energized by the mysterious disappearance and probable murder in 1826 of a New Yorker who was threatening to expose the secret rituals of the Masons, the anti-Masonic party quickly became a potent political force in New York and spread its influence throughout the Middle Atlantic and New England states. The anti-Masons appealed to long-standing American suspicions of secret societies, which they condemned as citadels of privilege and monopoly, a note that harmonized with the democratic chorus of the Jacksonians. But since Jackson himself was a Mason and publicly glorified his membership, the anti-Masonic party was also an anti-Jackson party. The anti-Masons also attracted support from many evangelical Protestant groups seeking to use political power to effect moral and religious reforms, such as prohibiting mail deliveries on Sunday and otherwise keeping the Sabbath holy. This moral busybodiness was an anathema to the Jacksonians, who were generally opposed to all government meddling in social and economic life. A further novelty of the presidential contest in 1832 was the calling of a national nominating conventions, three of them to name candidates. The anti-Masons and a group of national Republicans added still another innovation when they adopted formal platforms, publicizing their positions on issues. Here's what we stand for. Henry Clay and his overconfident national Republicans enjoyed impressive advantages. Ample funds flowed into their campaign chest, including $50,000 in life insurance from the Bank of the United States. Most of the newspaper editors, some of them bought with Biddle's bank loans, dipped their pens in acid when they wrote of Jackson. Yet Jackson, the idol of the masses, easily defeated the big money Kentuckian. A Jacksonian wave again swept over the West and the South, surged into Pennsylvania and New York, and even washed into Rock Rib, New England. The popular vote stood at 687,502 to 530,180 for Jackson. The electoral count was lopsided 219 to 49. Burying Biddle's Bank. There's some alliteration for you. <clears throat> its charter denied the Bank of the United States was due to expire in 1836, but Jackson was not alone, uh, was not one, sorry, well, Jackson was not one to let the financial octopus die in peace. He was convinced that he now had a mandate from the voters for its extermination, and he feared that the slippery Biddle might try to manipulate the bank as he did so as to force its recharter. Jackson, therefore, decided in 1833 to bury the bank for good by removing federal deposits from its vault. He proposed depositing no more funds with Biddle and gradually shrinking existing deposits by using them to defray the day-to-day -day expenses of the government. By slowly siphoning off the government funds, he would bleed the bank dry and ensure its demise. Removing the deposits involved nasty complications. Even the president's closest advisors opposed this seemingly unnecessary, possibly unconstitutional, and certainly vindictive policy. Jackson, his dander up, was forced to reshuffle his cabinet twice before he could find a secretary of the treasury who would bend to his iron will. A, desperately, a, de a desperate biddle called in his bank loan, evidently hoping to illustrate the bank's importance by producing a minor financial crisis. A number of wobbly banks were driven to the wall by Biddle's panic, but Jackson's resolution was firm. If anything, the vengeful conduct of the dying monster seemed to justify the earlier accusations of its adversaries. But the death of the Bank of the United States left a financial vacuum in the American economy and kicked off a lurching cycle of booms and busts. Surplus federal funds were placed in several dozen state institutions, so-called pet banks, chosen for their production sympathies. Without a sober central bank in control, the pet banks and smaller wildcat banks, fly-by-not operations that often consisted of little more than a few chairs and a suitcase full of printed notes, flooded the country with paper money. Jackson tried to rein in the runaway economy in 1836, the year Biddle's bank breathed its last. Wildcat currency became so unreliable, especially in the West, that Jackson authorized the Treasury to issue a specie circular, a decree that required all public land to be purchased with hard or metal money. This drastic sex slammed the brakes on the speculative boom, a neck-snapping change of direction that contributed to a financial panic and a crash in 1837. But by then, Jackson had retired to his national home, hailed as the hero of his age. His successor would have to deal with the damage. <clears throat> the birth of the Whigs. New political parties were gelling as the 1830s lengthened. As early as 1828, the Democratic Republicans and Jackson of Jackson had unashamedly adopted the once tainted name Democrats. Jackson's opponents, fuming at his iron-fisted exercise of political power, presidential power, condemned him as King Andrew I, and began to coalesce as the Whigs, 
a name deliberately chosen to recollect the 18th century British and revolutionary American opposition to the monarchy. Remember, they were called the Whigs. They opposed the king and the monarchy. They're calling Jackson the king. The Whig party contained so many diverse elements that it was mocked at first as a or unorganized, no, no, at first as an organized incompatibility. Hatred of Jackson and his executive's usurpation was its only apparent cement in its formative days. The Whigs first emerged as an identifiable group in the Senate, where Clay, Webster, and Calhoun joined forces in 1834 to pass a motion censuring Jackson for his single-handed removal of federal deposits from the Bank of the United States. Thereafter, the Whigs rapidly evolved into a potent national political force by attracting <clears throat> other groups alienated by Jackson. Supporters of Clay's American system, Southern states' writers offended by Jackson's stand on the nullification issue, the larger northern industrialists and merchants, and eventually many of the evangelical Protestants associated with the anti-Masonic party. Whigs thought of themselves as conservatives, yet they were progressive in their support of active government programs and reforms. Instead of boundless territorial acquisition, they called for internal improvements like canals, railroads, and telegraph lines, and they supported institutions like prisons, asylums, and public schools. The Whigs welcomed the market economy, drawing support from manufacturers in the north, planters in the south, and merchants and bankers in all sections. But they were not simply a party of wealthy fat cats, however, however dearly the Democrats wanted to paint them as such. By absorbing the anti-Masonic party, the Whigs blunted much of the Democratic appeal to the common man. The egalitarian anti-Masons portrayed Jackson, and particularly his New York successor, Martin Van Buren, as imperious aristocrats. This turned Jackson rhetoric on his head. Now the Whigs claimed to be the defenders of the common man and declared the Democrats the party of cronyism and corruption. The election of 1836. The smooth tongue and keen-witted Secretary of State Martin Van Buren of New York was Jackson's choice for appointment as his successor in 1836. The hollow cheek Jackson, now nearing 70, was too old and ailing to consider a third term, but he was not loath to try to serve a third term through Van Buren, something of a yes man. Leaving nothing to chance, Jackson carefully rigged the nomination at the convention and rammed his favorite down the throats of the delegates. <clears throat> Van Buren was supported by the Jacksonites without wild enthusiasm, even though he had promised to tread generally in the military booted footsteps of his predecessor. As the election neared, the still ramshackle organization of the Whigs showed in their inability to nominate a single presidential candidate. Their long shot strategy was instead to run several prominent favorite sons, each with a different regional appeal, and to hope to scatter the vote so that no candidate would win a majority. The deadlock would then have to be broken by the House of Representatives, where the Whigs might have a chance. With Henry Clay rudely elbowed aside, the leading Whig favorite son was heavy jawed General William Henry Harrison of Ohio, hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe. The fine spun schemes of the, the Whigs availed nothing, however. Van Buren, the dapper little magician, squirmed into office by the close popular vote of seven, uh, 765,483 to 739,795. But by a comfortable margin of 170 to 124 votes for all the Whigs combined in the Electoral College. Big woes for the little magician. Martin Van Buren, eighth president, was the first to be born under the American flag. Short and slender, bland and bald, the adroit little New Yorker has been described as a first-class, second-rate man. An accomplished strategist and spoilsman, the Wizard of Albany, he was called, he was also a statesman of wide experience in both legislative and administrative uh, life. <clears throat> in intelligence, education, and training, he was above the average of the president since Jackson. The myth of his mediocrity sprouted mostly from a series of misfortunes over which he had no control. From the outset, the new president labored under severe handicaps. As a machine-made candidate, he incurred the resentment of many Democrats, those who objected to having a bastard politician smuggled into office beneath the tails of the old general's military coat. Jackson, the master showman, had been a dynamic type of executive whose administration had resounded with furious quarrels and cracked heads. Mild-mannered Martin Van Buren seemed to rattle about in the military boots of his testy predecessor. The people felt let down. Inheriting Andrew Jackson's mantle without his popularity, Van Buren also inherited the ex-president's numerous and vengeful enemies. Van Buren's four years overflowed with toil and trouble. A rebellion in Canada in 1837 stirred up ugly incidences along the northern frontier and threatened to trigger war with Britain. The president's attempt to play a neutral game led to the wail, Woe to Martin Van Buren! The anti-slavery agitators in the North were in full cry. Among other grievances, they were condemning the prospective annexation of Texas, which we'll talk about later. Worst of all, Jackson bequeathed to Martin Van Buren the makings of a searing depression, 
Much of Van Buren's energy had to be devoted to the purely negative task of battling the panic, and there were not enough rabbits in the little magician's tall silk hat. Hard times ordinarily blight the reputation of a president, and Martin Van Buren was no exception. <clears throat> Depression, doldrums, and the independent treasury. The panic of 1837 was a symptom of the financial sickness of the times. Its basic cause was rampant speculation, prompted by a mania of get-rich-quickism. Gamblers in western lands were doing the land office business on borrowed capital, much of it on shaky currency of wildcat banks. The speculative craze spread to canals, roads, railroads, and slaves. But speculation alone did not cause the crash. Jacksonian finance, including the bank war and the specie circular, gave an additional jolt to an already teetering structure. Failures of wheat crops ravaged by the Hessian fly deepened the distress. Grain prices were forced so high that mobs in New York City, three weeks before Van Buren took the oath, stormed warehouses and broke open flour barrels. The panic really began before Jackson left office, but it was fuel full fury burst about Van Buren's bewildered head. Financial stringency abroad likewise endangered American economic house of cards. Late in 1836, the failure of two prominent British banks created tremors. And these, in turn, caused British investors to call in foreign loans. The resulting pinch in the United States, combined with other setbacks, heralded the beginning of the panic. Europe's economic distress, distresses have often become America's distresses, for every major American financial panic has been affected by conditions overseas. Hardship was acute and widespread. American banks collapsed by the hundreds, including some pet banks, which carried down with them several million in government funds. Commodity prices drooped, sales of public lands fell off, and customs revenues dried to a rivulet. Factories closed their doors, and unemployment workers, unemployed workers milled in the streets. The Whigs came forward with proposals for active government remedies for the economy's ills. They called for the expansion of bank credit, higher tariffs, and subsidies for internal improvements. But Van Buren, shackled by the Jacksonian philosophy of keeping the government's paws off the economy, spurned all such ideas. The beleaguered Van Buren tried to apply vintage Jacksonian medicine to the ailing economy through his controversial divorce bill. Convinced that some of the financial fever was fed, by the inje- was fed by the injection of federal funds into private hands, he championed the principle of divorcing the government from banking altogether. By establishing a so-called independent treasury, the government could lock its surplus money in vaults in several of the larger cities. Government funds would thus be safe, but they would also be denied the banking system as reserves, thereby shriveling available credit resources. Buren's divorce scheme was never highly popular. His fellow Democrats, many of whom longed for the risky but lush days of the pet banks, supported it only lukewarmly. The Whigs condemned it, primarily because it squelched their hopes for a revived bank in the United States. After a prolonged struggle, the Independent Treasury Bill passed Congress in 1840. Repealed the next year by the victorious Whigs, the scheme was reenacted by the triumphant Democrats in 1846 and then continued until it merged with the Federal Reserve System in the next century. At this point, my classes will be stopping now. We'll come back to Texas later, and we'll also talk more about the uh, next election system a little bit later. Good luck.